Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is David Dimitri, and I am the program director at Headwater Science Institute. I am very excited to welcome you to our student presentation night for this year's fall research experience program. Now, we've had three exceptional students take part in our program this fall, and I am looking forward to you getting to meet each of them tonight and learn a bit about what they have researched over the past 10 weeks. Now, before we get into tonight's presentations, uh, I just want to let everyone know that these presentations tonight are a great example of what other students can do as part of our upcoming spring research experience program that we will uh, have beginning in January. So for those of you watching at home who may know of a student that could benefit from such a unique research experience, or if you are a student yourself looking for an opportunity to conduct your own research, please be sure to check out all the details at our website, headwaterscienceinstitute.org, or by uh, following the link that you see at the bottom of your screen. All right, so let's go ahead and we will get into tonight's presentations. For those of you watching at home on Facebook Live or YouTube, we encourage you to share any questions you have for our researchers during their presentation in either the comment or chat features on each site. And so following each presentation, we'll actually have some time to allow each student to answer some audience questions. So please feel free to uh, take part and participate in this research experience night. I'm now excited to introduce uh, one of our research experience mentors, Justin Toller. Hey, Justin, how are you? Hello, fine, David, how are you? I'm doing really well, thanks. So Justin, Great. why don't you go ahead and uh, briefly introduce yourself before I introduce our first presenter. Okay, thanks. So yeah, my name is Justin. I am a PhD student at the University of Nevada in Reno. So here I study the, the physics and uh, the properties of, of glacial ice. So primarily ice sheets such as Greenland and Antarctica looking at the, the physics of the formation and the deformation, and then also caring a little bit about how the ocean and ice sheet bottom interface interact with one another as uh, warm water gets circulated underneath the ice sheets. So doing mostly that. Awesome, thanks, Justin. So Justin and I were actually fortunate enough to work together this fall to mentor our first student presenter, Albert Joe. Uh, Albert is a senior at Newark Academy in New Jersey, and he's actually one of two of our students joining us from New Jersey tonight. And Albert joined our research experience this fall after an internship this summer actually really got him interested in pursuing research. And Albert's been really great to work with this fall, and I think Justin would definitely agree with me on this. He, uh, Albert has all sorts of fascinating research interests. This includes astrophysics, econophysics, and philosophy. But he's also really interested in painting and piano as well outside of those. So. I'm so happy to introduce Albert as our first presenter tonight. So we'll go ahead and uh, allow Albert to take it away. Uh, thank you for that introduction. So I'm gonna be presenting on my research on the effect of linearly polarized light on plant growth today. So a little bit background about what my topic's on. So light is actually a type of electromagnetic radiation, which is made up of in a magnetic field and electric field as shown in the picture on the right. And when light is passed through a polarizing filter, the light is polarized, in this case linearly. This means that the magnetic field and electric field will be forced to oscillate in a certain orientation. Um, and I was thinking that plant growth is very dependent on photosynthesis and photosynthesis is uh, based off of light. So I was wondering whether linearly polarized light would affect plant growth. And if so, would it cause plants to grow faster or differently? And I want to conduct my research on this. Uh, so I did a lot, a little digging around and I found that past studies have shown elliptically polarized light to impact plants. So this means light that is being forced to rotate in an ellipse, um, either clockwise or counterclockwise. So I developed a research question um, with Dr. Dimitri, and I ended up with if garden crust plants are grown under vertically linearly polarized light, horizontally linearly polarized light, and natural unpolarized light, will they show a difference in growth uh, in terms of their growth rate and how high they grow? So my independent variable was the polarization of light. I had three groups, one being vertically, vertically linearly polarized light, one horizontal, and one just natural unpolarized light. And my dependent variables were the growth rate of the crest plants and height each day. Uh, I hypothesized that plants would grow um, the fastest under unpolarized light uh, because I thought that this would be how plants have naturally developed in nature. 
So a little bit about my materials and methods. Um, I used a pH moisture and light probe, uh, some seed starter pots, growing medium and growing containers. And I chose the garden cress of uh, the Lepidium sativum variety to grow because I did some research on them and they're supposed to be fast, um, fast growing seeds that are uh, easily affected by different conditions. So I started off by planting the seeds into seed starter pots and put the pots into a growing container. And I made sure that all the light entering each container passed through the respective polarizing film or um, light transmission film. And I maintained the conditions of growth like temperature, um, humidity, and time of measurement. And I took measurements every day. So this is the kind of container that I put each one of my plants inside. And as you can see, the polarizing filter is placed over the box's opening. Uh, so that all the light that would come in and affect the plants would pass through this filter. I kept the box near a window so that uh, the plants would be receiving natural light and this would mimic the actual growing conditions of the garden cress. So my results were pretty interesting. Um, overall, the plants grown under vertically polarized light displayed a consistently higher height than the other two gro groups. Uh, horizontally polarized light grown plants and natural light grown plants showed very similar heights and they only differed in the end on day eight by 0 0.0516 millimeters. Um, to analyze my data, I ran an ANOVA test, which stands for the analysis of variance. An ANOVA test compares and separates the observed data to see if there is any correlation. Uh, my results were not statistically significant. And I had an ANOVA result uh, of a p-value of 0 0.68633, um, which is much higher than the 0 0.05 ANOVA p-value that would be needed to consider my data stati statistically conclusive. So seeing as the polarization of light had a minimum impact on plants' growth, it could be worth looking at uh, how light directly affects photosynthesis and the chlorophyll of plants. Um, my experiment, while I do think it was sound, still can be improved a lot. Um, and one thing I was thinking of was increasing the amount of light as the polarizing filters would decrease the amount of light uh, naturally passing through so that I could um, uh, more exaggerate the effect of the polarized light on the plants. And I was also thinking of allowing light to enter from all around the plant instead of just one face of the container so that this would uh, more accurately mimic the growing conditions of garden cress in real life in the wild. Um, so while the results were not taken as statistically significant, uh, my, my results do have um, implications. And seeing as they were not affected by the polarization of light, farmers, greenhouse um, owners, and other kinds of agriculturalists know that they don't need to avoid the polarization of light and they don't need to implement um, filters to polarize light to control the growth of their plants better. So some future research directions that this uh, could, experiment can be taken in are analyzing the uh, effect of polarized light on different kinds of plants. Garden cress is considered a leafy plant, meaning that it photosynthesizes through the leaves. Um, and I was thinking that this might differ between other kinds of plants like coniferous plants, algae, and moss. Uh, I was also thinking that it could be worth looking at elliptically polarized light because there's been a study done on circularly polarized light, and I did a study on linearly polarized light, but uh, there's still no research on elliptically polarized light. And to get a full picture of the effect of light on plants, it would definitely be worth taking a look at. So lastly, these are some of the sources I referenced in my research. I want to thank Mr. Toller and Dr. Dimitri for helping me out so much in my research. And they were both extremely helpful and welcoming to me. Thank you. All right. Great job, Albert. Thanks so much for sharing. We'll now uh, open things up to audience questions. So just a reminder for those of you watching at home on Facebook Live or YouTube, we encourage you to share any questions you have for our researchers during the presentations. Um, on either of those platforms. So uh, let's see, to kick things off, um, Justin, do you have any questions for Albert? Yeah, so I was wondering if, if you, you know, got like some million dollar grant or something like that and wanted to continue this research, 
Um, what would be, I guess, your ideal setup? Like, what would you, what parameters would you finely tune? How would you set up a new research uh, facility, even to to really dive deeper into this to find more statistical, uh, meaningful data? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I think I would take the experiment in the directions that I um, mentioned about improving the. Uh, experiment. So I'd probably place the plants in a more natural growing environment where light can enter from um, all around the plant. And I'd also still polarize the light by uh, maybe making a greenhouse out of polarizing filters or some other material. And I'd have inside of my uh, experiment, multiple kinds of plants, including coniferous plants and algae and moss. Um, in addition, to some other leafy plants and trees. And uh, finally, I definitely increase the sample size because one reason why an ANOVA test might not show statistically significant results is because the sample size was too small and the uh, small differences um, in the uh, growth might not have shown up as well in a uh, sample size of 27 like I had. Cool. Thank you. Great. All right. We'll take uh, some more questions here. We'll see if we have any coming in uh, from the audience. Oh, there you go. So why did you choose the research topic you did? Yeah. So um, I, I was interested in um, how polarized light affected plants because um, I was thinking about how plants were, plants are grown and a lot of their growth is based upon light. And in physics class, I just learned about how light was polarized. Um, and my physics teacher demonstrated this using polarizing filters. So um, I just began wondering what would happen if the light that plants um, grew under was polarized. And if so, would that make the plants grow in a certain orientation or grow slower or just grow differently? Great. Let's see. I have a question, actually. Um... Albert, so we've been fortunate, Justin and I, to chat with you in our meetings weekly about next steps for you. You're you're in that fun stage right now of uh, you know getting ready to go on uh, next year to college, and, and we've talked about some of the interviews you've had at different colleges. Is this something that you would be interested in pursuing um, in terms of maybe potential undergraduate research, depending on where you go, or do you feel like this um, research has at least set you up to potentially explore this field a little bit more in your next steps in college? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think I would definitely pursue undergraduate research. I think this um, experience really set me up with a lot of insight into how um, the scientific methods used to answer questions and how um, actual scientific researchers will uh, go through the process of writing a research manuscript. And I think um, in my next few years at college, uh, I definitely want to do something like this again with a a different group of people and possibly in a different uh, field. But I think that overall getting to ask a question and figure out how to answer it was really cool and um, definitely worthwhile. Excellent. That's, that's great to hear. And we look forward to seeing uh, what type of research you'll take on next when you do make that next step. So, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and um, thank you very much, uh, Albert, for sharing uh, your research. It was definitely really exciting to hear about and, and to, um, learn a little bit more about maybe the next steps for you in taking this research elsewhere. Um, and Justin, thanks again to you for all your help guiding Albert through uh, his research this fall. It's been very helpful and it's been uh, great to work with you as well. Thanks. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be involved. Albert, you did a great job. David, it was nice working with you as well. All thank right. You. Really fun. All right. Thank you both very much. So I am now going to go ahead and introduce our second presenter for tonight, uh, Sarah Zonayad. Uh, Sarah is also joining us from New Jersey, really uh, providing a great example along with Albert that uh, our research experience can be conducted by students just about anywhere. Uh, Sarah is a junior at South Brunswick High School, and it's really been a pleasure working with her as her mentor this fall. Um, she has a really strong interest in, in math and science that I think comes through in her project. But I think what's really impressive about Sarah is her commitment to community service, uh, in addition to her focus on schoolwork and this research experience. It's been a lot of fun talking with her about some of her uh, work and things outside of this project uh, throughout the course of this fall. 
Uh, Sarah took on a really unique research project that was quite literally in her own backyard in New Jersey, and I'm excited to have her share some of that research now. So Sarah, go ahead and you can take it away. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my research question or what I've been focusing on is the effect of temperature, specifically cooling, on Lacorma delicatula, which is the spot and lanternfly, um, specifically in the adult stage. So uh, the first part of my presentation is obviously my introduction and um, my experiment. So to introduce my experiment, the spotted lanternfly is an invasive species that poses a great threat to agriculture and economy, specifically for fruit-bearing trees and vines because they feed on the sap of these different types of trees and vines, and they leave uh, um, this kind of residue that attracts mold and essentially kills the plant. Um, and there has been a recent increase of this population in different parts of New Jersey. And it's fairly new to this part of um, North America as well. And it originates from the uh, from Eastern Asia. And the way that the government, uh, the New Jersey government, also Pennsylvania, has responded to this is by instructing people to kill the fly if they come across it. So this kind of goes along with some of the ethics of my experiment, which I'll discuss um, in a bit. So previous research on the spot and lanternfly shows that um, colder temperatures can affect the biological processes and development of the spot and lanternfly during its nymphal stages. So basically while it's developing into an adult. Um, and since at the time uh, that these researchers in Rutgers uh, worked on this experiment, they did not have adult lanternflies readily available. So I, my uh, research topic is basically focusing on just that group of the population, since that's what I had available. Um, and then you can take a look at the temperate, like basically the results of my experiment and how temperature affects the, adu um, the adult population and look at historical climate data to predict how the population can be affected by like drops in temperature and overall uh, temperature changes throughout the year, especially in a place like New Jersey where we have uh, many different seasons and a lot of range in temperature. So my research question is basically, um, at what temperatures do the spotted lanternflies become sclerotized, which is basically that they're immobile or um, frozen, but they're still alive um, when they become unresponsive and when they are deceased. Um, so like I mentioned, this might pose an ethical like dilemma, but this is how we are supposed to uh, in react to these lanternflies because they are invasive and harming our plants. And as long as they aren't being taken out of quarantine areas, um, there isn't a problem with working with these uh, organisms. So my hypothesis is that was basically that um, they would not survive in temperatures below freezing because of the like of the fluids in their body and um, just general cold, like the fact that they're cold blooded because that means that the temperatures internally become like they're greatly affected by changes in external temperatures and that they would experience permanently reduced uh, responsiveness um, when exposed to uh, these very low temperatures of like like 35, 40 degrees Fahrenheit and like five degrees Celsius. So my variables that I worked with um, was I basically changed the temperature and also the time that they remained in these different temperatures. And my dependent variable is the condition of the specimen. So my materials for my experiment is basically a container um, to contain the flies wherever I was placing them. And then I used different tree branches for sustenance so they wouldn't die on me because of because of a lack of uh, sustenance. And I used different types of trees. So I had uh, one, one was pine, one was a moor cork, and the last one 
was Korean Swarta. And I did that because I didn't, I wanted to make sure that um, the specific type of tree branch I used didn't have that much of an impact on my results or didn't change it as much. Um, I used a bottle cap to secure it and to maintain these different temperatures, I tried to use the outside temperature, like the air temperature of um, kind of the environment that they were already in. And then I altered it a little bit by placing them in an ice box with proper ventilation since I did not want them to die of oxygen deprivation. And then obviously a way to catch the insects. So my method was basically to set up that kind of micro um, environment and then um, check in on the temperature and the condition of the fly. So whether they were responding by very gently prodding them because the what the reaction is normally to like um, kind of jump and also flutter away. So depending on how they reacted to that gentle prodding, I would determine if they were responsive. And then whether they're mobile is basically if they're moving around or moving their limbs. And then I repeated this depend and changed the temperature and the time. So for my results. Um, so I conducted three trials. So my first trial was more of a uh, was more of a control. So here I have um, the three different temperatures which I placed them in. So the coldest is around uh, like freezing and then moderate and then like 60 to 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit and then the conversion to Celsius. And then I placed them back at room temperature, which is like 71 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And I have the conversion of Celsius up there so that I can tell if they were um, if they were deceased or if they were sclerotized in that time period. And my results basically showed that those that were placed in the coldest temperature um, were immobile and res unresponsive the entire time they were placed in that temperature. But then when I placed them back at room temp, um, two of them became like mobile and but they had a delayed response and one ended up dying. And in the moderate temperature, I had one um, slightly impacted where it was responding in also a delayed manner. And then for the last one, though there was a little bit of a change at the end, they all ended up coming back to that mobile and responsive um, condition. So overall, there was a very high survival rate. And then for my second trial, I made it a lot colder. So here I changed the temperature to see how that would impact um, the uh, the spotted lanternflies. And so here um, we can see that all of those that were placed in that very low temperature of like 10 degrees Fahrenheit, um, they all ended up dying. And then those that were placed in um, the moderate to warm temperatures, they mostly stayed alive except for one that had a delayed response. And then lastly, I took a look at whether the time period um, affected the spotted lantern fly survival rate. So here I doubled the time and tried to make the temperatures close to that of my original trial. And here we can see that there was almost a 0% survival rate for those placed in the coldest temperature for four hours. And then like a slow change for those that were placed in the moderate um, temperature. But in the end, the results are very similar to trial two, where we had all individuals stay alive for moderate and warm, except for one that became unresponsive, but was still moving. So for my discussion, um, from my experiment, I, was, I concluded that they were able to survive temperatures lower than freezing because that's what I started off with in that first trial and that they can be revived after being frozen, so sclerotized, because when I placed them back in that room temperature, there were two that came back it, from that frozen immobile state and one of those actually ended up outliving the rest, including those that were placed in the warm temperature. And that 
the chance of survival decreases as temperature fluctuates since I like the the specimens that I use obviously were experiencing great temperature fluctuations and they all died around 17 to 24 hours after I conducted each of my trials and I saw this also as I was collecting the flies that in nature that we had like these varying temperatures of around uh, like 60 in the day and around 32, 31 at night. And that the day afterwards, I'd find it very hard to find um, specimens to test. And then finally, significantly decreased chance, um, they have a significantly decreased chance of survival after temperatures being placed to temperatures below negative 13 degrees Celsius and being exposed to temperatures below freezing for a longer period of time as shown by my last two trials. So to explain this, I did some more research and found um, some articles about, or some like papers about how other types of insects are affected by colder temperatures. So there was one explaining how, um, especially insects that are freeze intolerant, which I concluded after my experiment um, that the swatted lanternfly could not survive as low temperatures. So here, one possible explanation for that delayed responsivity in those um, in from my experiment for the specimens is the fact that they could have uh, depolarized muscles. So basically, since their muscles and the way they move is kind of dependent on action potentials and um, kind of the electric field inside cells, they tend to become depolarized under these colder temperatures. And I'm, I think they fire more and that's, uh, that kind of slows things down. And then another possible explanation for um, why they're not responding or why some of them passed away is possibly change to their DNA and also the interaction between the cells within. And one main point that I think um, explains a lot is the cellular dehydration. Since when you look at a deceased spotted lanternfly and a live one, the main difference is that the abdomen, the abdomen of the insect shrinks a lot because of that fluid inside is, is basically let out. And since that's kind of what's circulating and keeping everything warm and regulating homeostasis within the insect, once that's kind of out of there, it, you know, can lead to death. So taking a look at New Jersey climate data specifically, um, the range of temperatures is around 25 to 35 degrees Fahrenheit during the winter months. And so I concluded that they can survive these temperatures, but what they can't survive is these greater fluctuations, especially during November and December. So there is a significant decrease in the adult egg bearing population after these couple of months. Um, and for future research, I still have my specimen, so I will be taking their mass and determining if the mass and the gender have an effect on, like if there's a correlation there. And since I had to do my research within my county and my area, since I can't take these bugs out of the quarantine areas. I think if someone could extend that research beyond this area that I'm in, it would make it much more conclusive. And if this experiment were to be done again, probably a better way to approach it is some kind of specific mechanism for determining the, for maintaining those temperatures, because, um, I had ranges of temperatures rather than specific ones since I couldn't regulate that as well, given I don't have um, the same kind of equipment that many people in labs do. And then these are just further questions of how can we contain them and how we can predict um, population growth or decline due to greater fluctuations in the climate due to global warming or pollution. So these are just further, like, very out there questions. So um, yeah, this is my work cited. And thank you for listening to my presentation. Uh, do you have any questions? All right, great job, Sarah. Super exciting to hear all about that research. 
Um, we'll again open things up to audience questions for those of you watching at home on Facebook Live or YouTube. We'll have time for a question or two. Um, and while we're waiting for potential questions to come in, um, Sarah, I'll start off just asking you, uh, can you tell us maybe a little bit more about what it was like for you to conduct this type of research and kind of thinking about what was the best part of doing this and perhaps what was one of the bigger challenges you had to overcome? So I came across many challenges in this experiment because I am working with organisms that um, go through seasonal changes and different phases of their life. And overall, like temperature controls outside and everything posed a lot of challenges for collecting the blo bugs, uh, collecting the bugs and um, kind of working with them because I had and I would collect them and they would kind of die on me and I wouldn't know why exactly. So um, I had to kind of walk around that. And then there were times where I couldn't really get a clear idea of what I was researching because I would go out and try to um, kind of determine if like the trees had an impact, if all these different things. And then it's hard to regulate, like it's hard to maintain uh, specific variables when you're working with something outside because you can't control a lot that goes on in the environment, especially if it's something that you're not around all the time to kind of contain and take a look at. So those were some challenges um, that I came across and I think I overcame. <laughs> and the most, the greatest part of this experiment was definitely like, like being able to see was like actually observing what they were doing and seeing like kind of this effect and collecting them, I think was the most fun <laughs> because <laughs> it was difficult, but it was very interesting because they are kind of, they are beautiful bugs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we'll see if we have a question or two from the audience. Here we go. So here's a question. Uh, what made you interested in this research? So, a big reason why I decided to pick this specific topic is because this has been all over social media um, about these spotted lanternflies. I would go around and see posters saying, oh, if you see this bug, this is what you should do. This is who you should call. So I was thinking that, you know, since this is so important right now and people are kind of aware of this, this would be something good to kind of take a look into so that I know what people are talking about and also so that I can help further this movement against these bugs in this specific area. Excellent, great. Um, well, that is great to hear. And I wanna thank you, Sarah, so much for sharing your research. You did a great job uh, overcoming those challenges, as you mentioned, and it's, it's really exciting to hear kind of why you got interested in this, uh, especially something that is, uh, like I mentioned, kind of in your own yard. So thanks so much for sharing and, and great job this fall. Thank you so much. All right. So I am now very happy to introduce our, our final presenter for the night, uh, Izzy Poland. So Izzy attends Truckee High School in, in Truckee, California. And in addition to being a great student and doing a wonderful job on her research this fall, as you're, you're about to see, uh, Izzy is an accomplished dancer and she's often been balancing dancing basically five days a week with her schoolwork and working on this research project. So uh, needless to say, she has been an extremely hard worker on her project and I'm really excited to introduce her tonight. So. Izzy, go ahead and you can take it away. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. So I did my presentation the, the past 10 weeks. I've been looking into the effect of utility poles on veg plant vegetation. Human impact um, is a big thing affecting the environment and we impact our environment in many ways, including pollution, chemical contamination, we burn fossil fuels and deforestation. And these things cause climate change, erosion, poor air and water quality. And so I looked at the human impact in my local neighborhood, specifically with telephone poles. So some of the chemicals that telephone poles are treated with are pentachlorophenol, creosote, arsenicals, and they're, of course, affected by the roads. And these things can cause phytotoxicity, which is um, injury or damage caused by chemicals to plants. They can affect the nitrogen cycle, which is a vital cycle to plant growth. They can affect the soil biome, and they can also cause physical damage by trampling. My research question was, how do utility poles affect plant vegetation? 
the independent variable I looked at was the distance from the utility pole. And my dependent variables were the number of individuals of plants and the number of plant species. And my hypothesis was there will be fewer plants close to the pole because of the chemicals and maintenance the utility poles require. And that's a picture of one of the utility poles that I looked at. And you can see that there's a road going up to it. The materials I used in the field were a quadrat, a soil core, uh, a densiometer, which is um, a device that measured shade coverage by leaves and the trees above, a field tape measure. And then I ran nine transects in total. And per transects, I would lay out 25 meters. And every five meters, I would put down a quadrat randomly. I'd take note of the individuals and the species number within the quadrat. And then I'd take note of how many sections each species took up. And you can see in my lower photo, the quadrat, that's um, squaw carpet in the left corner. And for that, I noted that um, squaw carpet took up five sections of the quadrat in total. My next step was to take a soil sample from each quadrat. And then my final step was to take the densiometer measurements from each quadrat. I turned my um, garage into a lab for a couple weeks. And within that lab, I used soil sieves, a pH meter, Dixie cups, a mortar and pestle, a graduated cylinder, a scale, measuring cups, and an oven. And then per sample, I would follow standard lab procedure, just making sure everything was standardized and there wasn't any cross-contamination between each sample. So I would take 15 milliliters from each sample to make a pH slurry, meaning combining it with water so I could get um, a reading from the pH meter. I would break up each sample into its particle sizes and then I'd sift and separate into Dixie cups and then take the weight and volume measurements. For my results, um, that's the graph of the distance versus individuals. And you can see there is a slight fluctuation at 15. I believe that my trend line would have reached its apex at 15 meters if I didn't have the outlier right at five or like the upper left corner. Um, and I had an R squared value of 1.83 three, which is not statistically significant. And if it were statistically significant, it would be um, 0.6 or larger. But overall, um, the individuals decrease the further away you got from the pole. The same thing kind of happened with the number of species. They also decreased the further away you got from the pole, and uh, my results were also not statistically significant. The distance versus densiometer graph showed that the further away you got from the pole, the more readings or like the more things were obscuring the light as you got further away from the pole. And this is pretty obvious because the further away you got from the pole, you'd start to get into the trees and those block the light from like the underbrush. And then my pH readings were pretty standardized. They usually laid between 5.25 and 5.5. .5, and there wasn't, or the pH at least did not affect my readings or they didn't have an effect on the individuals or the species number. So in the end, the number of plants and the number of species decrease for, oh, further away from the pole. And even though the results aren't statistically significant, I still did have an R squared value, which means it's not just totally insignificant. There was still a correlation. And I believe my... Um, Correlation was caused by the man-made clearing that is used to put the poles in to access the poles. And so the bottom left photo is a picture at the pole and you can see that there are much more grasses. You've got squaw carpet and rabbit brush among other smaller underbrush plants. The middle photo is um, a photo at the tree line. 
usually around 15 meters on the transects is where you saw that tree line. And around there, you'd have um, both the underbrush plants and the trees. So again, the grasses, the squaw carpet, um, rabbit brush, and then plus like Jeffrey pines and other coniferous trees. And then the bottom right photo is um, a typical example of what you'd see in the tree line. And because those plants are competing with the trees for both sunlight and other soil resources, you didn't see many plants out there, um, an occasional grass or brush, but uh, pretty much just dirt and pine needles. And so for future research, I would like to try my experiment in a different location, meaning somewhere in the desert or with plants that are not native to Tahoe. I would like to try more transects because I believe I would have more statistically significant or stronger data if I did run like 50 or 100 transects instead of the nine that I ran. I'd like to try a further distance such as 50 meters or 100 meters instead of the 25 that I tried because usually around the 15 meter mark was where the trees started and you'd get like standardized forest area. So I'd like to see if that um, like continues for a 50 or 100 meters. And then I'd like to try a different time of year. I ran my experiment late October when most of the plants were dead and you didn't see it was kind of hard to identify each species. And so I'd like to try my experiment during the springtime where you have a lot of plant growth. And some of the things I think other people can do or like professional scientists were um, to test for the chemicals such as the pentachlorophenol or the creosote or arsenicals in the soil to see if um, those chemicals are leaching into the soil by the pole and then also use proper lab equipment to get more accurate results. And there's my work cited slide. Thank you for listening. All right, great job, Izzy. Thanks so much for sharing all about your research. Um, so we'll again, open things up to audience questions. And I'll kind of start just by chatting with you a little bit. Um, so one thing that folks may not know is you you kind of um, initially went in with an idea of maybe using um, some some data from local businesses and stuff to, to formulate a project that was um, kind of something that you were interested in to look at effects of um, weather and, and changes in weather to to potential revenue uh, in your local your local neighborhood. Um, you kind of pivoted to this this more field based project, and I'm just wondering if you can comment a little bit more similar to what Sarah, um, what I asked Sarah about, you know, what was maybe the best part of now getting out and doing this type of field work um, and maybe what were some of the challenges that you overcame? Um, so I did my data collection day on the day that it rained for a while, like a lot of heavy rain. So it was interesting figuring out like how to keep everything standardized with the rain and how to also not freeze. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it took a while to get going. And my first transect, I think, took two hours. And then as I got better at it and like started to follow like not or like a standardized process and I was able to start rolling things a lot more quickly and I went from two hours per transect to like 45 minutes per transect. So it was fun figuring out um, just how to get things moving. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. And that's obviously a big uh, component of doing field work is you never know what the weather is going to present when you are scheduled to go out there to collect your data, but you did a great job of, of persevering and, and getting the data collected. So, so well done there. Um, let's see if we have some questions coming in here. So here's one. Do you have uh, any interest or intention of identifying a fieldwork area where telephone poles have been abandoned? Oh, interesting. Yeah. And do you have an idea of what differences you might find? Great question. There weren't many abandoned telephone poles that I could find in Truckee. I didn't even think about looking into that. Um, I did, however, read up on um, 
how like the live wires can release like charges which can affect plants so i think it would be interesting to see if they're um if that was affecting the plants at all and also i would imagine that if the telephone poles were abandoned um the telephone pole companies would not maintain the clearing that they made to um reach the telephone poles so there would probably be or like i'd imagine there would be a difference in the types of plants you saw so mm -hmm. i think that would be a very interesting follow-up question yeah excellent great question and, and great answer to that i think that would be really fascinating to look at kind of how the the different ages of the the management or those that have been abandoned may affect uh, your potential results so great maybe we'll have time for one more question Give a second here for the folks watching. So, okay. So now that you've completed your research project, do you feel that you have a better understanding of what working as a scientist would be like? Yes, I do. Um, actually, the person who lent me their densiometer told me while I was working, because the uh, my lab process also took a very long time, <laughs> mm -hmm. that if you are truly a good scientist, you could do 10 minutes of field work and then eight hours of lab work. So it, that was a very interesting part of it. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thinking and learning more about what, what each aspect of your project can take in terms of time is, is part of that learning curve as a scientist and also uh, part of the scientific process. So, uh, but again, as I mentioned, you did a great job of of kind of, I think, taking time management and, and, and really um, running with this project uh, for your data collection out in the field, but also that great work that you and the time you put in in the lab back at home. So um, it was cool to see those photos. So, so thanks for sharing a little bit about that too, of you working at home. Um, and also just thanks so much for sharing your research. You did a great job this fall as our other students did as well. And it's been a lot of fun to, to see your project develop and to get to this point. So, so great job, Izzy. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. All right, well, so that wraps up our student presentation night uh, from this year's fall research experience program. And I certainly wanna thank all three of our researchers for their hard work throughout the entire fall program. We're really proud of all the hard work you put in over the past 10 weeks. And I think everyone watching at home would definitely agree with that. Um, you've each put together your own unique research project this fall, and it's been really great to work with each of you as you've completed this research. So for those of you who are watching, um, who still may have a question for any of our presenters, please uh, be sure you can drop those in the comments section on either YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're watching along, and we'll be sure that those get forwarded to the students so that they can answer those as well. And again, if you are interested as a student or know of a student who may be interested in joining us, again, beginning this January for our upcoming spring research experience, please be sure to head over to our website, headwaterscienceinstitute.org, or check out the link below to get more details. All right, well, finally, I just wanna give a big thank you to all of you out there watching and, and for supporting our researchers tonight. Hope you all have a great night and we'll talk to you soon. Good night.